86, the podcast. This one's going to be an exciting one. Uh, I get to finally talk about uh, Morimoto Sushi Master, something I filmed back in, I want to say, August of last year. Uh, you guys get to get the bat. We're going to try to do a couple shafts, maybe by the episode. You let us know what you want to see. But uh, we have a new co-host. Hey, what's going on? My name is Jimmy. Jimmy. A uh, lifelong friend of Chef Mike's over here. A lot of really bad stories of some yes, really stupid but things. But we're going to keep that locked and key <laughs> in a box somewhere so we don't have to discuss those things. Because we're not here for that. We're here <laughs> to talk about Morimoto's Sushi Masters, which I'm really excited for. Uh, when I saw the plug for it um, on social media not too long ago, and I saw that Mike yeah. was going to be on there, I was really excited and super stoked to watch it on Roku. I mean, I, I still can't believe... I mean, we, we filmed over a course of two weeks. I still can't believe that I was out there on this guy who I, you know, honestly, that was one of the guys that uh, Iron Chef, watching Iron Chef at like, we, we go to the clubs mm-hmm. and then we get home. And then at 12 at night on Food Network, I'd be watching Iron <laughs> Chef. It's like 2098 and 2000, right? And I was like, man, you know, just eating a sandwich from like a 7 Eleven or something. And, uh honestly one of the reasons why i'm doing sushi is because like i just was like this is this is badass man this is really yeah. cool and uh now i get to be on the show and it was intense it was that sounds, fun it sounds crazy but the viewers and listeners want to know what kind of sandwich that you did you get from 7-eleven because there's only one kind that you should get what is that i i mean dirty Dirty hot dog at two in the morning. I'll never say that. That's gross. <laughs> Cuban, man. Cuban. Cuban. That is the Cuban. only way to go if you go to 7 Eleven. So, um, super awesome. So, where was this whole show actually filmed? So, uh, they all shipped this out to California, Los Angeles. You know, uh, they built this huge studio out there. And the backtrack, you know, it. <sighs> I got the nickname, and I hate to say it because it's so super embarrassing, and everyone laughs when I say it. I got this, and you'll hear it from all these other chefs. Michelin Mike, please do not tag Michelin Mike. But, <laughs> Hashtag. So, yeah. Uh, because, yeah, we got the Michelin star. I, the high, kind of the process, um, I found them. They found me on Instagram, shot me a message. Uh, you know, originally, they were saying that it's going to be a fusion sushi uh, thing and I was not really that into it, but they said, but a really well known TV personality for sushi was going to be involved immediately. There's only one, right? Mm-hmm. There's only one that you, and they're like, yeah. So immediately from that, I didn't care if we were going to make hot dog sushi, chicken <laughs> finger sushi. It's like, I'm going to be making sushi for Morimoto. I'm game, I'm down. Uh, let's start the process. And so that was uh, about March, mm-hmm. uh, March time. I remember I was, uh, you know, just kind of starting that process with casting directors. And then um, June 9th of uh, 2022, we, we, we got the Michelin star for Soseki nice. just about a year after we opened. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's when everything kind of turned around. It was just bananas, you know, and, and things started really like, okay, things are getting crazy. Mm-hmm. And then they get the call. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't you jump on this TV? Why don't you jump on this TV show as well? And I'm like, <laughs> How am I going to juggle everything? But, uh, you know, I have a, we have a great team here sitting in the back room of Soseki. <laughs> so if you hear like cursing and some pots and pans, uh, we, are, we are getting ready for service tonight. So question for you. So with somebody that's kind of new to the food industry or just trying to become a new foodie or whatever, how important is the Michelin star to the industry? And, and what did it mean for you guys when you guys were able to finally accept that award? Oh man, you know uh, the Michelin star for a lot of chefs. They a lot. I don't care about awards, and I understand that. And you shouldn't be. It, it's about the guests first, and you happen to get the star, and that's what we did. We, I mean, we had the restaurant a year, year and a half before. No, yeah, about a year before uh, the announcement of like Michelin and they're coming down here and everything. It's been a lifelong dream of mine to be uh, a Michelin star chef, but it wasn't a driving force to open up Soseki, our little, you know. 10 seat omakase here in orlando but it, it it was definitely a driving factor and i say you know you can't really say you want it or you don't until you receive it and see what it does for you mm-hmm. it completely turned around their operation um you know a 10 seat restaurant at the price we were doing it in orlando we're working day and night for this project here um 
you know, it was a lot of self sacrifice. Mm -hmm. and, and there are nights, there are days that we get to four people. That's it for a service. Mm -hmm. And when you only have 10 seats, man, those margins <laughs> are. <laughs> Don't open a 10 seat restaurant if you want to make a lot of money, right? Yeah. Okay. This Unless is... you're Waffle House, that's okay. Waffle House all day. <laughs> I think they have 12 seats, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, don't do that. And um, what happened after it was just an influx of amazing new guests mm -hmm. that found us out. It was the first year Michelin came to Florida. So there was just an influx of these amazing guests. We were getting international guests, uh, uh, guests from, from all over the world uh, coming to try you know, the new one star restaurant in Orlando. Mm -hmm. So for me, I am forever grateful to the Michelin. Everything has flaws in it, whatever. But for me, that, that completely changed the trajectory of we are going into summer season, the slowest season for Florida mm -hmm. and uh, kind of, do we change the programming? Do we have to cut a guy? I didn't want to do any of it. And uh, skin of our teeth, it, it, it all kind of came about. Yeah. That's awesome. So obviously you're able to kind of enjoy uh, the fruits of your labor and the hard work that you guys have been able to put into it so far. Right. Um, I guess the better question would be at this point, how did you get there? We, you just don't randomly take a class to become a Michelin star <laughs> chef. Right. So, I mean, what was the dedication and the hard work that kind of paved the right. path for you to get there? Yeah. I, I think it early two thousands, that TV celebrity chef or, you know, it was really glamorized to be a chef in some degree. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with, Food Network and Top Chef and all these things were, were really jumping off. But I think really the, that 2000, 2010 was really a hot time to be a chef. Um, and, and it was really appealing. But, uh, you know, we went to high school together. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what I was going to do. You kind of had like, <laughs> you, you, you knew you were going to get in college. I was like, I ain't getting in no college, man. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm like community college just to let my parents be happy that I got some kind of degree. Mm -hmm. And my folks were like, just do, uh, why don't you just be a chef? Why don't you just go for culinary because you're, it's kind of what you're into? I mean, that in, in wrestling. and uh, <laughs> I mean, like WWE the wrestling. Iron Sheik, by the way. God rest his soul. He yeah, yeah. Away, he just, uh, just passed away. But uh, that kind of wrestling, not like yeah. professional wrestling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like five, five and a quarter and a half. Like, <laughs> I'm never going to make it to WWE. So I decided to go culinary. Went to Valencia, did the whole community college thing. And then uh, landed one of my first jobs was uh, Wolfgang Puck as like um, – pizza chef right because mm -hmm. back in the day fashion square mall if mm -hmm. you know orlando fashion square mall <laughs> was it we were those kids that stayed at the mall from 9 a.m till close yep and uh that was like my first job in high school is that you remember yep. that like all of our friends was work were working yep. in the mall yep. pizza we would shop. just hang out and swap yeah. foods and hey i'll give you a, a lolly cup boba tea if you give me one of your yeah. slices of pizza and that's just kind of how I, and i work for like a really prominent pizza company sabaros yeah. man it's yeah. the real deal it's you good. Know, they you still do. they still exist. They still exist. So <laughs> you'll find them in any of your local malls. <laughs> Stromboli is amazing. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was uh, the real New York slice, man. Sabaros. That was like my first job. But they got me to do. You know, uh, Wolfgang was really known for for his pizzas and stuff. I got the job there, and then immediately, uh, maybe it's because I'm Asian. I went. I went to sushi. <laughs> <laughs> okay, he's, he could he could pass yeah, so, yeah. saying y'all all the time but he could pass and started doing sushi there and then i got the bug to um travel and i had a great opportunity with the levy company and i was doing like tennis years soap and i was opening restaurants in, in um in california i mean this was like i was barely 21 and they were giving me these opportunities i said let's go to a bigger market Went to Vegas and found a really great mentor there uh, and spent a couple years with Joel Robichon, who mm -hmm. has, uh, you know, I would honestly say I didn't really you know, know or was all about Michelin until I worked there. And, uh, you know, I was opening restaurants as a sushi chef. I felt great. I was doing it for, I was with Wolfgang for over four years. Mm -hmm. Go there. I'm like, bottom of the barrel, the worst person, worst cook possible. <laughs> and, Should have been the dishwasher. <laughs> yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. And it was Awesome. And yeah. it was awesome. They just got one star. They just got uh, in their Latelier. They got three stars in the, in the mansion. And I was like, man, um, I need I need this. I want this. And mm -hmm. so that that kind of flooded, you know, drove it all. Yeah. Yeah. So obviously you said that you've been doing this for about 22 years now. Yeah, um, 20, 20 years. Yeah. You know, or something along those lines. <laughs> but at one point in time, somebody who's ever been doing anything for that long, um, has there been moments where you're just kind of like, I don't know if this is for me anymore, and you're just ready to so just many. hang up the knives and, and, and call it a day? So many times. I think it's just uh, – and this is – art 
and craftsmanship and but it, at the ultimate ultimate end it's a business and it just it's grinding man mm-hmm. 60 70 hour days or weeks excuse me you know 13 hour days um it's it's grueling mm-hmm. and you're just <laughs> i saw this comedian it's like yeah chef scallops <laughs> like, it's like yeah oh you know it, it's like yeah but that is it like, yeah chef um, what are you an idiot sandwich oh <laughs> <laughs> no for real for real and that, that was it it's like what are you putting yourself through but i mean um just so much passion involved but it just gets grueling um so when was it i think i left i was working for uh, another mentor jennifer carroll in um in Philly at mm-hmm. 10 Arts with Eric Repair. I was a sous chef. I always, I mean, I just actually flew back from Philly yesterday and we we're talking. It's like, I was cooking, uh, we were, I felt like we were cooking some of the best food we've done in our career. And, and she agrees. And it was just a good time. We were changing the tasting menu almost every day with her. And the, the local farms in Philly are amazing. But it's just the grind of working in a hotel and being a chef. And uh, I just stopped. I just was like, you know what? I'm over it. Mm-hmm. You know, the politics of, of not being able to control your food. And as a young, angry, you know, yeah, I could say that was a not angry, you know, you know, emotional chef. Um, it, it just took its toll. And so I took some time off, uh, some time off and did other things, did media and stuff like that. And, Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, even in Hawaii, when I went back, when I went to Hawaii to cook, uh, losing that, uh, not losing that opportunity, but you know, an opportunity presented itself, open your dream restaurant in Hawaii, Packed up my wife and we moved down there. <laughs> Dream turned into a nightmare real quick, but <laughs> but you're stuck in paradise, you know. It literally in the middle. Of, I mean, you're just in the island in the middle of Pacific. Yeah, I wasn't gonna head back to the stateside, so we, we stayed a couple of years, and I decided just to like be a beach bum for a little bit. Yeah, and, nice. Yeah, yeah. Find yourself, you know. That's kind of like the ultimate dream. I think it just everybody just wants to kind of hang out in a little little yeah. beach shack and not have to work as hard and just enjoy the the fruits of. But of, like the things that you've been doing with marketing and stuff like that. Yeah. You taking a step away, I think it kind of opens up your vision of what's possible and and what you really enjoy about the business, and then come back in a different mindset. Yep. Um, and so I think that was that was it for me for okay. sure. Yeah, yeah. So with you working really hard, obviously there's a lot of chefs out there that are very talented that that work very hard in, in doing what they do. Um, what made you stand out for you to be able to get on to Sushi Masters? Yeah. So I'm curious about that. You know, I always, you know, I worked for Jen Carroll, um, you know, on and off for many years. And it was, I'd even travel with her and do a bunch of events. She was on Top Chef season six in Vegas, which is so funny because while I was in Vegas, they were Mm -hmm. filming in my restaurant uh, at Robichon. But, uh, and then, and then she was on Top Chef Masters and a few other projects. But I, I learned an immense amount about being a chef, but also being a brand, being a chef, but also your name is everything, Mm -hmm. what you're associated with. And um, she really prepped and and put that in the forefront. And Mm -hmm. I don't think a lot of chefs think like that, but it it is a big deal. Um, You know, any publicity, any opportunity to get in front of people. And then, but you also have to bring the goods. You have to be a good chef and also Mm -hmm. be able to say, Hey, uh, I'm going to tell my story in 10 seconds and really be able to deliver on the food and uh, the storytelling. Um, So I think that was really important. And then when you open your own restaurant, it's like, yeah, uh, you know, I'll juggle, I'll (laughs) eat fire, whatever I need to do to put butts in seats. Uh, Because as you get into this ownership role, it's not just you you're taking care of and your family, right? I've got a group of like five, six, eight guys out there that are really, if I can't fill those seats and I have to let someone go, you know, that's never what you want to do, but um, they truly rely on you. And so you, you dig deep, man. You, you yeah. gotta, you know, <laughs> hawk some, uh, you know, some cut codards or whatever. I'll <laughs> be where if it's going to bring in some, some revenue to the team. Yeah. Um, but that's where it started was, you know, um, you know me, man. I'm a, yeah. I, I was a break dancer in high school. Yeah. And we were brought our own dan- cardboard. Brought our own cardboard. <laughs> <laughs> We'd always try to, I mean, between the, me and him, I think we were like the center of attention guys. But so it came a little natural. Now my, as I'm older, like I was really shy yeah. to get on this um, competition show. You know, I'm, I'm cooking every day now in a different way. I mean, uh, there's no time limit, right? I'm yeah. doing 10 seats at my restaurant. I go there and it's... um 
scallops. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> go, go, go. The, the competition, you know, for me, I got really competitive on the show. Yeah. And I, I think you could tell I was very serious. So now that, now that we're talking about it a little bit, so obviously without divulging too much, because obviously you guys got to stay tuned and wait for the episodes to release. Right, right, right. <laughs> um, what was your experience on the show? I, I would say what would what was the thing that you liked most about it? Um, you know, you're stuck in this micro environment with of two weeks with the same people going through the exact same um, you know, we're all going through the same thing together. Mm -hmm. So I think like in two weeks, you, you end up getting really close with, with the other cast members and really get to, you know, um, and then, and then it becomes natural, uh, being there. I think, uh, I love competition. Mm -hmm. I really do. I, it, it was fun to showcase, um, where I've been, what I'm doing, uh, trying things I'd never do at my restaurant. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I took <laughs> I took some rests. Maybe it bit me in the butt. Maybe it didn't. Maybe, yeah. We won't know until you watch the episode. <laughs> but uh, I think that, yeah, yeah, just kind of cooking outside of your environment and then really seeing if, if you got the goods. I've always, uh, you know, these quick fire, these little challenges or something like that. You know, I, mm -hmm. You got competitive in the restaurant, right? Peeling potatoes or or doing prep work and stuff. It's like, oh, who could do it faster or right. who has the nicest, you know? Um, so I think that that definitely that edge of competition, but also just the people, mm -hmm. you know, meeting chefs from around the globe, uh, meeting uh, you know Morimoto and the, I mean, he is so he's I I don't know how to explain it. Morimoto is so crispy. I mean, he is like head to toe, <laughs> head to toe. Like he is Chris. He is the man. king of swagger. Yeah, he does. He is. Yeah. He is. I've met him once. Mike doesn't actually know this, but I met him once. Oh, really? Uh, at actually Morimoto in Disney Springs. Disney Springs it was here? for a uh, beer event that I worked at yeah. a few years ago. So um, I actually have a photo with him somewhere floating in, <laughs> you know, the cloud. He's uh, crispy, man. Yeah, he's, he's super nice. Though. Super really nice. Actually, my wife and uh, she she'll always tell this story. My wife actually worked at Morimoto in Waikiki doing accounting when we lived in Hawaii, and uh, I guess she got stuck in the elevator with him, and she's like. <laughs> you know, losing her mind in front of him. And he, she was like, oh, he's so nice. He's like <laughs> head to toe, white, completely like brand new white shoes. Yeah. What, you know, just like, oh, you know, looking so fresh. I was like, dope. Yeah, it's you. Well, you <laughs> sign these paychecks. <laughs> <laughs> that was like the only interaction. I don't, think, I don't even know if she got like one word out you know, for, for it. Yeah. <laughs> but that, it was cool to, to kind of be in that kitchen arena kind yeah. of thing. Because this is his first competition show out of Iron Chef. And um, I was like, kind of joking with him. I was like, yeah. "You want to get in there, don't you? <laughs> you you want to go? You want to go? You want?" He's like, "I thought you guys wanted to win." <laughs> yeah, you want to rumble? You want to rumble? Like, I'll take I'll take him on. You know, it was it was cool. And then he did a couple demos, which was like, just to be in. I mean, it was only a group, a handful of us, and, and we're watching him do um, some demos or different things like that throughout. And you're just like, "Wow, yeah, I mean, he's got it." Yeah. Yeah, when you're a chef, you're a chef, right? It just comes really natural to him. It, like right yeah, yeah. Him. Just he he could I bet he could just he could keep going. That's awesome. Keep competing. Yeah. What would be obviously that's your favorite thing is that you know the competition part of it being close knit, but what would be the least favorite thing of, of doing the show? Uh competition part and being close knit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean yeah. it's double edged did sword. You, right? Did you just use the same bathroom all <laughs> <laughs> you? <laughs> no, it's like you know, you get on each other's nerves and it's still competition, right? So you're really, um, you know, there are some fierce competitors here. And there are guys who really, you know, really brought it. Mm -hmm. um, guys and girls who really competed. And, and it wasn't like, I'm the only one that wants it. So okay. that was that was tough, you know, when it starts getting down to just just a few people. Maybe I made it, maybe I didn't. But when it comes down to a few people, it, it, it does get pretty uh pretty gnarly, you know. Does the show provide you with the actual tools to kind of like make it an even playing ground for everybody? Or do you guys all provide your own knives? You get like, I mean, uh, you're bringing your own knives and you're bringing, you know, it's their ingredients, everything. And mm -hmm. it really is like, what you see is what you get. You got to figure it out. It's spur in a moment action uh, that you have to you know, go think on think on your feet mm -hmm. um we're you know given uh, a, a small little tools that we could bring and stuff right. like that which is cool and i think that's what also it, it was a cool nod because it let us be a little unique to what makes us what you know our history and what we are and stuff like that so that was pretty cool 
Yeah. Do you guys now just like, you know, certain people who who have certain tools in the industry that kind of geek out geek out about it? Do you guys kind of geek out about each other's like knives and stuff like oh, that? Too? Oh, a hundred percent. You <laughs> know, oh, it's like, where'd you get that knife? I want yeah. the knife. <laughs> and everyone brought some, you know, yeah, all knives yeah, and stuff. You have like a billion that. dollars to buy this knife. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not that much, but yeah. Definitely like just just different tools. And you it's interesting to see too, like what what everyone brought and, mm-hmm. and all, you know okay they're leaning toward this or these tools or uh they might go more molecular or more traditional or something like that but Mm -hmm. uh, that was definitely pretty cool to see it's cool so obviously you saying molecular that kind of gives me a whole different aspect of cooking because obviously there's the passion of it where you love and and you want to try different flavor profiles and there's the science side of it right there's the craftsman side of it it's it's a craft when i say craft it's like there's that artistic side of it but there's the putting in a hundred hours to be good at something mm-hmm. there's there's the repetition of being a sushi chef of yeah making you know nigiri every single day and continue to figure out these little nuances um you know at suseki we have one chef doing just a sushi program mm-hmm. 10 and those sushi chefs out there that do omakases or you know 10 at 10 nigiri you know that's a hundred pieces in an hour and a half or 30 minutes or whatever we're giving them uh that's a lot that's a lot of pieces to do mm-hmm. um but it's like uh you have to have one guy that's just focused on like the craft of sushi i think and then the other guys fill in with all the other um uh you know all, i mean i think we're like 22 courses around 22 courses here so they fill in all the other dishes um which takes a lot of different techniques a lot of you know with sushi it's fish and rice man yeah and we always say you know sushi is 80 percent taking care of fish Mm -hmm. how well you could take care of the fish once you receive it how well it's received to when it hits the plate there's not much to really do but there's a lot to do kind of thing right yeah yeah so with fish i mean you know there's 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 some that are kind of like purists and there's some that are very experimental so there's some people that believe that the fish should just be eaten the way that it is right. with, without any kind of sauces or, or any of that stuff. But then there's others who love to experiment and right. like to change. Not necessarily. Spicy mayo on everything. Yeah. I, 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 like, I dig it, man. Spicy mayo is good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's good. So you're not a traditionalist. It's, it's a hard one to, you know, I think it just depends on, I think you have to learn your tradition. I think, um, you know, as a young sushi chef, especially in America, um, I got, I overlooked the traditional side. I started learning traditional side uh, later on when I worked with like Masa and then, uh, you know, um, one of my other mentors, you know, Taka, who now owns like Nami Nori in, Mm -hmm. in um, New York. And he's, he's doing amazing stuff with his, but he taught me from, you know, nuts to bolts and it was very traditional and i didn't realize how much i missed Mm -hmm. uh in in the thought process of like i'm missing all these things because i don't know tradition traditional japanese and then once i opened this place it was like okay let's go back to it let's get you know fish aging and also new style dry aging let's get all japanese fish and really focus on on what it means to use all these different techniques uh and uh, on all these varieties of fish, you know, there's more fish out there than just bronzino salmon <laughs> and tuna and guys tuna. for real. I mean, <laughs> and like, scallops. and, and hawachi <laughs> or whatever. And that's all you see at these sushi bars. And there's nothing wrong with that, but there is definitely just these, um, that all deserve, you know, to be on that level. Right. So where do you, you know, obviously with constantly needing to experiment and, and constantly needing to evolve, um, sometimes within the food industry is not where the inspiration is at. So 100%. where do you draw the inspiration from for you personally? Um, I would say, I mean, personally, get off Instagram, get off Facebook, get off all the social media and stop looking at other chefs and what they're doing. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's great to see, okay, it, they're getting this in this season, but to get really inspired um, by ingredients or what have you. I mean, we have, we've been in partnership since the very beginning or pre-opening with edible education experience here in Orlando. Mm-hmm. And it's a local garden farm that's nonprofit that teaches people about where the food comes from. And uh, that partnership for me, just, I always say, anytime I'm just stressed or overworked or something, I need to go there um, and just walk the garden mm-hmm. and, and see what's out there. I remember saying, uh, a saying to the, like the head gardener there, um, Brad, I said, man, you know, Florida, Orlando can't grow good asparagus. And I was like dead set on it. And he's like, okay, 
come with me. But it's a li- <laughs> like little like four stocks, right? It's a little bit more educational, so they're not doing it for the full time. It's like he just cuts it off. He's like, try this, and it's like literally the most juiciest beautiful asparagus I've ever had mm-hmm. and uh so a lot of inspiration and in what we do we try to stay um 80 to 90 percent local in regards to like vegetables produce uh eggs dairy here in orlando mm-hmm. um there's so much confinement in that that mm-hmm. we don't get some pretty cool stuff like maybe rhubarb or white asparagus but uh for the past two years playing in that that sandbox uh, allowed us to really get inspired to, yeah, try things in its most you know, optimal time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So from your past experience, what would be one thing that you say that you've been able to kind of learn during your sushi time or during your, just your chef experience in general um, that you've been able to kind of carry out? That's something that you can also pass down to like the next generation of chefs. Yeah. Um, just because you're a great chef doesn't mean you're a great coach or leader. I think that was huge for me. It's like, if you're the guy who can cook the best in the kitchen and no one else can keep up with you, mm-hmm. what's the point of that? Yeah. And as a young chef, I think a lot of us want to be that person. Mm-hmm. And then now being a, I don't say older chef, but definitely <laughs> running teams. I guess and I already lost. He doesn't have his hand. walker yet yeah. with his little <laughs> tennis balls on the cane. So we're good. <laughs> but, but for sure, like now that I'm running teams and, and, and building that, it's like uh, inspiring them to like, collectively be good mm-hmm. how do collectively there's not one person that's you know weak in the team and as much as that kind of slows you down mm-hmm. as a young chef you want to like jam mm-hmm. that uh will ultimately make you a better chef because uh, you're gonna learn something you know from from that experience yeah. yeah so now that you've been able to take that from your previous experience with your experience from being on sushi masters yeah what did you actually get from that like what was your learning experience from that from sushi masters oh man uh what did i learn (laughs) cue the jeopardy music please (laughs) right what did i learn um i mean so much about yourself and competition and being in that role um I definitely took it a little too serious, maybe. Uh, <laughs> Dude, it's just a, it's just I mean, a TV we're going <laughs> to interview some of these other chefs, so maybe they'll, they'll um, you know, definitely took it a little serious. Uh, but, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know, man. There was so much to just it, – it's, it's a completely different environment. And then just getting out of your own way. Mm-hmm. I think that was the biggest thing is, you know, you're, you're up against a clock. You – you have to cook. And so I think it's very, for me, I took this thing very strategically and I learned how to, you know, you take each uh, challenge and you work with it. Mm-hmm. Maybe not necessarily at Soseki, I'd put spicy mayo on the menu, <laughs> but in context, y'all bring that spicy mayo. Yeah. <laughs> bring that Q, bring that QP over, bring, the, bring that Duke's, Duke's mayonnaise over here. Um, no, but yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, if I'm have to cook uh, and do a catering thing in the middle of a field, and and all we have is just a big bonfire to cook, you're not going to try to do uh, Michelin fine dining in that context. Right. You know, you you just adapt to the situation. I thought I think that's the biggest thing I learned is like being adaptable. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know how many battles Morimoto has been into, but he's had to you know constantly adapt and change. Mm-hmm. And that's two things I think adapting and changing is really hard for shows. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm We're kind of you, stuck in your ways. Yeah, right? the no, one, for sure. Because you're, uh, you know, you do beer rap and yeah. you're, you're in kitchens quite a bit. All the time. Meeting chefs, meeting owners. Like, we're set. We're yeah. dead set in our ways. In a bad, good and bad way. It's yeah. good and bad. It's kind of, it's kind of one of those things that, uh, you know, I tried to paint the picture that even though you may have been doing something a certain way for so long, doesn't necessarily mean that there's not opportunity for you to be able to do it better. Right. Right. But I think a lot of them are are very traditional in the sense like this is what's been working for me. I don't want to mess with it. Right. And sometimes they kind of close off that opportunity of, well, this could work even better for me. And so they're, they're afraid to kind of take that leap just because that's a risk and they're not willing to take risk right now because that's probably like the least important part of their day. Right. Oh, hundred percent. But I think, as a chef or as an owner, I think comprehensively, you should look at the entire picture because obviously if you included something in your program, it was there for a reason versus just kind of like, Oh, I'm going to give this only 10% of effort, but I'll give this like sometimes you are as a chef, you are looking at the whole picture and that's, what's like freaking you out. That's just so much to do. I mean, it really is a back breaking, grueling 
operation, man. Right. I mean, I've been doing it for so long, and there, there is a lot. Chefs say absolutely thrive. You have to be a kind of special person, like thrive in this yeah. environment. You're not just cooking anymore. You're like watching twenty other guys cook. You're making sure that you know nothing catches on fire, and things are being received well, and products and. It's serious organized chaos. One hundred percent. But that's but also, you've built yourself a it. really solid team to be able to help support that. Theory, right? Most times, most so times. that way you're not. I mean, that's true with any situation, right? I mean, at the end <laughs> of the day, you still if you have to be accountable for yourself, and and if it has your name on it, you right. technically have to kind of oversee everything, right? So that's just kind of natural. That's it, man. Um. So yeah, I mean, uh, but we got a couple days until it airs. Hopefully, we'll we'll get this podcast out. Um. Definitely let us know if you want, if you guys want to see more, if you guys, I'd like to do like a, I think it's being released all at once, but we're going to yeah. like figure it out. Maybe we'll, 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 we'll do an episode. We'll talk about it. Stuff like that. Yeah. Get the reenactments. You yeah, know what yeah, I mean? yeah. See yeah. how much they hated the other chef during that episode. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. We got to bring all, we'll try to bring as many chefs on board, but uh, dude, yeah, it was fun, man. Yeah, it was fun. Fantastic. Hopefully Weird. you guys keep me around. You yeah. know, if you like me, hit the like button down there, <laughs> subscribe it a little bit, you know? <laughs> it's weird for me to be interviewed for this because we've been running me and Fernando we've been running this podcast for uh four months no like six months now six yeah. eight months and we've interviewed a lot of guys and so this is actually my first interview because yeah. I didn't want to talk about myself it's like yeah. yeah I was like but uh cool man it's, that's why my wife hates it because I know how to ask a lot of questions <laughs> <laughs> definitely like and subscribe let us know what you want to see that's it we're out we don't have an outro boom there it is. <laughs>